Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, definitely an amazing venue. Um, cool. So uh, to make it easier, uh, my name is uh, it's a typical Polish name, but it's always hard to pronounce. So uh, after explaining that or, or pronouncing it once or twice, someone showed me in the team that I could actually uh, write it, uh, spell it differently, so English speakers uh, get it correctly. And which is pretty cool because I just found that I have tech, like technology, as part of my name. I never saw that before. Cool, I think that uh, we can get started. I'm here to uh, tell you something about uh, serverless. Uh, but before I do, I uh, thought it would be nice to introduce myself. And uh, just if I had to pick a single thing to describe my career or my work, I'm a generalist. Um, which is both, I guess, good and bad. There's a, a lot of talks about how uh, specialists are more effective uh, and how you should hire uh, people specialized in a single technology or maybe even uh, generalizing specialists which have a, like, a single uh, strong leg but uh, can see a variety of technologies. Um, that's definitely not me. There was a time that I had a strong skill in this Java Spring Hibernate uh, world. It was a long time ago. Um, but here you can just see technologies I've been working with for last five years only, and at least several months uh, with each of them. Cool. Um, OK, uh, currently I just recently joined uh, Codility. Probably some of you know the company. Uh, which is uh, actually testing coders. So I, actually that's a, a pretty cool line. Cool. So a talk about serverless should start probably with uh, what serverless is. And this is actually uh, pretty difficult to uh, begin with, mostly because serverless is not a uh, very well specified thing. There isn't single RFC for uh, which tells what it is or uh, any other specification. It's just something that uh, someone invented the name and uh, people adopted it somehow. Uh, but there are a variety of different explanations about serverless. So there are several points I got um, here on the screen uh, that for me are our most important uh, parts of uh, serverless software. First and the most important one is that you write code uh, that abstracts from the server as such. Uh, so instead of manipulating an instance or a groups, group of instances, you just write a code that focuses on the logic itself, on passing, trans transforming data, but not on uh, populating the machine, installing the dependencies uh, there, and things like that. Uh, and you can think about these levels like going deeper and deeper into the pattern. Uh, so not everything that calls itself serverless uh, is going to be like that, but a service application should be pretty much stateless which means that you often can just shut down this application, you can boot it again, or just uh, populate it uh, um, on 100 machines, and it doesn't need to uh, prepare an internal state, you can just uh, work whatever it is, and can die at pretty much any moment. The third uh, pretty nice thing about, uh, about serverless is that usually it's even driven. This is uh, reactive programming. So it doesn't do polling. It doesn't uh, check whether it should do some work. It just focuses on responding to some kind of event or change in our system. And the last one uh, is that this is actually short-lived. Um, it's not a specific thing that you have to program somehow, uh, but you should be aware that the idea of running your code is actually to have it uh, do its work and then shut it down. Cool. So uh, next part is, uh, oh, actually, uh, there's a pretty popular another name uh, for that, which is function as a service. Uh, there are some good things about it. I really like uh, this part that uh, function 
means something simple and small and definitely short-lived. Yeah, like you get an input and you return an output. What's wrong with this uh, definition is actually that uh, function usually uh, is confused with, uh, uh, you could call it pure function. Uh, that means you just get something as an input and return an output, and that's it. You have no side effects. For ser serverless apps, you usually, uh, this is the whole deal, uh, that you make some side effects. So uh, the name is not uh, very well in this part. Uh, and I like this really nice comparison. Uh, I thought that you can think about serverless code, serverless software, um, as you think of uh, S3, uh, AWS S3, for your files. You never manage your disks. You don't have to expand disks or install and uh, format new disks. What do you have? You have a very high level API for just put file, move the file, delete it, uh, things like that. But that's pretty much it. So you abstract from the file storage. It doesn't mean that you don't have one. You definitely do, even more, because this is duplicated and all of, uh, lots of operations are involved. It just you don't have to do them and you don't have to care. The same thing is uh, with serverless. Cool. So to be able to uh, distinguish, um, one thing that serverless is not um, is backend as a service. And this is a very popular term, and many use it uh, for apps like uh, Parse or Firebase or things that let you just focus on the client side um, instead of developing your backend. So you can just uh, hit the database, configure uh, who can access uh, which parts or what the API is, but not directly implement it. Um, on the other hand, like one of the most uh, popular articles uh, come from Martin Fowler, definitely one of the uh, most uh, significant uh, influencers in the community. He actually uh, treats these two ideas uh, together. So there might, might be some confusion around it. And the uh, second one is uh, parallel computing. If, if, if you have uh, if your problem is actually to uh, transform a lot of data and you need to process it effectively, uh, you probably could do that with serverless. It's just not optimized for such uh, tasks. You probably then uh, should be looking for Spark or Hadoop to process them. Cool. Oh. Um, okay. Um, being more concrete, uh, there are several options right now to start doing serverless work. And the first and the most uh, important and well-known is AWS a Lambda. It wasn't the first one uh, to, to, to have invented serverless. Uh, you probably all uh, remember something named Google App Engine uh, many years ago. It actually had a very similar idea. You just had this limited framework to create your app. But then uh, you can go just ahead and scale up down uh, without thinking about it. Uh, but Lambda, uh, AWS and Lambda definitely popularized the whole thing recently. Uh, and shortly after Google released its uh, cloud functions, uh, Microsoft, uh, Azure is a really great cloud. They're developing lots and lots of ideas. Actually, it's hard to think of. Uh, any popular thing that they haven't implemented yet there. Um, and then um, one of the last one is uh, OpenStack Picasso. Uh, it's really good that someone implements something that is not platform uh, specific that you can just move around to your own cloud. But this is very early stage, I think, and uh, still just good to play around um, for now. And some minor frameworks that let you act as you have uh, serverless, but what you actually do is uh, you run just Docker instances uh, on Kubernetes and things like that. Um, which is actually uh, a good idea. It just you probably uh, want to wait uh, until these solutions are more mature. Cool, so I'm gonna focus on AWS Lambda 
uh, in this presentation uh, because of how popular it is and to be able to actually show some uh, examples. And a couple of things about Lambda. Uh, first of all, uh, it integrates nicely with uh, other components in the cloud. Uh, it's completely event-driven and you can use a variety of triggers um, to launch your code, your functions there. So starting from S3 files, uh, you can plug into whenever a file is being added or removed or anything like that, or on the database level. Uh, free on the uh, SNS actually is a very important one because uh, if you have a lot of things to do, um, and you don't want to synchronize all of that uh, traffic or think about uh, how this is being executed, you can just put all of the events on the queue and your call, your function will be actually autoscaled to uh, cover all of them as fast as possible. Uh, CloudWatch uh, makes you, lets you uh, plug into uh, different things in the AWS as such, but one very important one is uh, scheduling. Uh, so you can just make a constant statement to uh, make backups or have some cyclic job to be done. Um, and of course, API Gateway, which lets you plug in your function just to an API endpoint. Um, okay, let's uh, see this way. Uh, and okay, it uh, supports some languages, some uh, platforms, starting with uh, Node.js. They recently updated to 6.10 as well. Uh, Java is in version 8, so I guess with the release cycle, uh, it's good for next six years or something. Uh, I guess Python was actually, for a long time, it was just Python. 2.7, which sucks because of how Python community wants to really move, finally adopt Python 3 uh, before it turns 10. And uh, finally, uh, just a month or two ago, uh, Lambda added this possibility. And .NET, um, but in the end, if you just feel like running something else and you want to add your own language, uh, what you have to do is actually, while bundling the application, you can just add any binary file. So as soon as it runs or on regular EC2 instance, it will run uh, inside of Lambda. So you can add languages as well. Um, one of the problems actually with uh, writing Lambdas is that uh, you're writing them for specific uh, provider. And there's a lot of advantages you can uh, take out of it, but it's going to be hard for you just to migrate between AWS Lambda uh, to Google Functions and to Azure because every uh, single instance has a different API for that. Uh, fortunately, the API is pretty minimal. It's still just a function that takes uh, even that triggered it um, and returns a response. So you can just encapsulate all of that API into a very thin layer, and you're going to have to rewrite this single layer to move around. Cool. And the most important thing about the whole idea of Lambdas is its pricing model. Because of how short-lived and auto-scaled it is, it's super important that uh, you are actually going to pay only for the time uh, that it was executing and for the execution uh, number. So you're going to have to first pay for every single execution. Oh, sorry. Um, and then, okay, yeah, this is it. Um, and then uh, for the time span uh, counted in hundreds of milliseconds. Um, the price depends on the uh, memory consumption uh, that you declare up front. Uh, but the important part as well is that FreeTire is very generous. Some examples here is that uh, if you want to uh, do uh, many executions, let's say uh, for every million executions, you're going to uh, pay 20 cents, which is definitely uh, not that expensive. 
um, as you might think. But then if you have this very small function for just um, manipulating data or uh, using other APIs and that's it, uh, you can run it for multiple days um, within one dollar. And if you think about the free tire, uh, then it actually lets you run a single instance all of the time for almost a month uh, on the, the, the smallest memory. And you even half of a uh, gigabyte uh, can last for days of constant execution. But if you want to start using Lambdas uh, and you're building like a web page or a small service that is going to be called, uh, you actually can try multiple, multiple examples before you get to pay the first uh, dollar. Um, this is how it uh, actually looks, the, the interface for putting your code into the cloud to be executed. Uh, this is a simple Lambda written in Python. So you can just see it uh, consumes an event uh, in the beginning and uh, manipulates it, returns uh, the HTTP response. Uh, what you cannot see right here is all of the steps for managing uh, cloud um, uh, APIs endpoint, uh, configuring them, um, manipulating roles and author authorizations in the cloud. Actually, it took me, as I counted, 22 or 24 steps uh, just to make a Hello World application uh, for the very first time, which sucks, uh, obviously, it's hard to uh, begin with. So uh, definitely even just someone told me that this is just low level to, uh, to use as a, on a daily basis. So let's go higher level. Uh, we want to use uh, serverless, uh, but we don't want to you know, code in a browser, right? Or upload zip files uh, ourselves or write everything uh, bottom up to automate such things. So there's a variety of frameworks to start with. Mo most of them are uh, very young. And the first one uh, is, uh, actually we will focus on that later, so let me skip it, skip it for now. Um, and there are server uh, frameworks for a variety of languages. Um, one of them for Go, which uh, bundles it together with the application. Um, so it's uh, really easy to start up. What these frameworks usually do, uh, they will bundle your application together, compile it, uh, it if it's needed, uh, compress it, upload it as well, and configure other resources in the cloud. Uh, if that's needed as well. So serverless uh, framework. Uh, the name is very confusing. Uh, it's really uh, easy to stumble upon this framework if you're looking anything about the pattern and the other way around as well. Uh, so I guess it was a pretty smart decision to name it like uh, so. First of all, it will take care of your deployments. So uh, what you need to do, you need to bundle your code together. Uh, if it, it was simple, if it's just one file, but if you have multiple files, um, importing them uh, together or maybe even other libraries, that's uh, quite a task to be done. Very important part is that it's declarative. So you don't have to write a script for um, uh, triggering your code on S3 uh, bucket change. You can just declare it using YAML. This is very, very readable. Um, it will uh, manage some uh, resources as well to uh, create your uh, private networks or set up a uh, database as well. Um, and some minor things, but still important. It lets you uh, see the logs locally in an easy way connect to triggers and execute locally, which also is a very nice thing to debug, to uh, test it before uh, deploying that to any test environment. Cool. So this is actually part of the, um, uh, of the YAML configuration file for the framework. Um, service is just like a unit of work. Uh, it's gonna be deployed service after service. So it's okay to uh, totally skip it. Uh, and then you actually have to specify the provider because serverless 
at least it tries to abstract from different providers, try to unify the API so you can move your code around. But then again, you're just using different things from the cloud as well, so uh, that would be extremely hard to do anyway. Um, okay, so you have to specify your runtime, um, which will execute your code, and then you're declaring, declaring functions, uh, which is the most important part here. Um, and you can bind it to some events. This example shows you HTTP method get. Cool, and uh, uh, this is actually the body of the method. So uh, as you can see, the API is minimalistic. So you just get the event uh, context for configuration stuff and a callback because just don't forget you're in Node.js environment. So it's not enough to just exit from this method. You have asynchronous code. So in the end, you just have to call code back to show that uh, your result is ready. Cool. Um, then the deployment. Um, so if you want to deploy, there's actually several steps. Uh, lots of uh, things is being automated here, so uh, the whole packaging and uploading that. But then it has to configure uh, cloud form. It uses cloud formation for execution, but uh, it has to configure uh, API endpoints uh, as well for you. So you can see a single uh, login here. Um, what you can do? It actually takes a while to bundle and uh, see whether everything is already deployed, what needs to be updated. Uh, so uh, for this uh, shorter feedback loop, you can also use partial deploys. Um, so you can just deploy a single function if you're just working with the code and want to test it. There's a method for that, very, very useful. Um, so then you actually want to go ahead and try it out, right? So you can either use uh, serverless for invoking the function with some uh, specially prepared event, or you just can hit your API. Uh, so that's actually way simpler uh, with the framework. Just several steps. Okay, cool. Um, so we're in the cloud, and there are different usages, uh, many of them which are just calling other APIs to do some work. Uh, so can you do it asynchronously? Well, you can, like in Node.js, you can use promises for that, uh, not to hold the whole thread, um, and in the end, you just have to remember to call callback to, 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 to finish the whole flow. Um, well, if you uh, think about it, it's a great uh, thing for the whole infrastructure. If you're not taking too many threads, if you're non-blocking, you can just operate with I.O., not blocking the CPU. But then, on the other hand, I thought initially that uh, it doesn't make you pay uh, for the time that you are just waiting when you're idle. But you have to pay for the whole execution time for your Lambda. So uh, who's actually um, gaining here is AWS because they can put multiple processes into a single instance. Uh, and if you, if you want to take advantage of that, you have to batch your work and execute that uh, within a single instance. And if you're a fan of uh, ES6 like I am, you can uh, just use different plugins. One of them is Webpack, which contains Babel for uh, trans uh, down compiling, transpiling um, to older version of uh, Node.js, and you can just use async code, which is, I think, uh, way more readable. It's easier to remember that you have to call back, uh, call the callback uh, in the end. Cool. Uh, an example with uh, working with files, uh, if you're want to manipulate any files, you still uh, have a AWS SDK, you can just import it and use it. Uh, in this example, you can see uh, how a new object is uh, being created uh, as a result of the function. And uh, on the other hand, if you just want to be notified when something changes on your S3, uh, what you can do is uh, just use event uh, from S3. So it makes it more uh, harder to move between different providers, uh, but then it's very, very readable 
just to use it like that, and you're going to have the event object in your functions. That's pretty much it. Cool. Scheduling, this is super uh, useful for uh, any kind of maintenance work, making backups, making sure that something happened, something occurred. Uh, there, you can just use cron uh, expressions to have that happening. Okay, so uh, there's a variety of use cases uh, that is perfect for lambdas. And these are like the biggest selling points there. One of them is image processing for S3. You can just have that auto scale. If someone uploads their uh, new avatar, um, you can just uh, create thumbnails completely separate uh, from your main applications. Chatbots will, will just take care of incoming messages when it's needed, and then they will shut down uh, if there's no traffic at all. Websites, you can bundle uh, them together, which probably doesn't make sense if you're serving uh, static files, but then if you just have the single or two functionalities uh, which are dynamic, like a contact form or submit to demo, you can just put it on Lambda. Um, inconsistent traffic on uh, any app is actually a killer feature here because you don't have to take care of all of the scaling up and down it will automatically re respond to whatever uh, is your tra current traffic. Log anal uh, analysis is pretty obvious there because uh, you probably don't want to mix it with your core app not to uh, have the high highest, higher complexity there. Even sourcing is a great thing to have as a Lambda because you don't have to create a big pile of functionality in your app, you can just have an um, event log and lots of functions building on top of that. Even creating other read models can be uh, done completely separate, uh, separately from your app. Cool. Uh, I think that how this all works together is extremely important because uh, just looking at past several years, uh, I can see how easy tools are the most important thing. It's, uh, we're ignoring a lot of knowledge, a lot of major frameworks, and just go and try it out. Node.js with a million of dependencies that were just created, uh, because it's very easy. We can uh, just have a one-liner to try it out. And then uh, they go more and more mature as we go. Uh, but lambdas are super easy uh, for people that are just starting out uh, their whole development path. They don't have to do any operations. They, they don't have to uh, create servers, populate them, uh, manage them, backup, anything like that. They can just focus on code. So they can have no operations at all. Still, operations will have to be done, but just not by them. Um, several limitations and uh, as limitations, I mean, there are some architecture decisions uh, taken by the serverless way. So I guess that this is just the way uh, it has to be. Uh, there's not much disk space and uh, memory is being uh, limited time for uh, function execution. We can configure most of them, but then again, there are still uh, pretty strict limits after that. Um, cool. And some important pain points is it's really hard for now at least to monitor uh, current usage to see how many functions are running or were running um, historically. It's hard to debug. It's hard to actually SSH to a running instance to see what's going on there because you just abstracted from the server. So it's harder to uh, manually see uh, what's going on. And the, the, the third one, I was actually surprised to hear that. I wasn't able to reproduce that. But some people actually said that if they have an instant wall of request instead of just increasing traffic, uh, it was actually quite a while be, before all of the requests were processed. So if you have just this kind of application when you have to create millions of uh, events at some point of time, it might be very uh, difficult. Okay. Oh, last minute. Um, and cost management, um, it's hard for me to estimate upfront to see how much 
will I have to pay for this code execution um, and to limit that, which is actually pretty important. And biggest win definitely is uh, scalability. As you can see, uh, you don't have to manage that yourself, pricing model, and lack of uh, operations. Okay. Um, I have two bonuses if I uh, will fit. Uh, first of them is a small framework that uh, you can start with just putting your application regular, like not written for serverless, and you can put it to Lambda as well. There's uh, one Python framework for WSGI, um, which is very, very popular. So you can put your Django or Flask app just to the cloud and uh, ignore the, the whole fact that it wasn't prepared to work like that, and it will auto-scale. Of course, the, app, uh, the starting time uh, will be painful there. Cool. Uh, and the other project, actually, uh, there's this uh, great startup, uh, or maybe a new product um, called Golem, which uh, makes, uh, lets you uh, submit your own resources or register your own resources, even your laptop or your data center, to the uh, cloud, and it's, built, uh, it's being built on blockchain, so you can have this huge cloud of, uh, for computation not driven by any company, like completely distributed framework. So maybe that's a future, uh, or it, and it, it sells itself as a lot cheaper option than any concrete cloud. So who knows? Okay, uh, I guess that was it. Thank you very much.